Good morning. Good morning. The pleasure to bring you God's Word based upon Jesus' parable in Luke 16 today. I, I caught my mother reverse cheating in Monopoly one time. We were playing Monopoly and with my little sister and being very competitive siblings, I wanted to win pretty badly. It'd be my turn to roll the dice and my, my car would be on my little sister's property and I would try to roll the dice real quick before she saw it, but my mother would say, wait, Shannon, check your properties. She made me pay her, pay her, pay the rent. My little sister got up to go to the bathroom and my mom slipped a $500 Monopoly bill over on her side. What? What is this? Don't you want to win, Mom? I want to win. She said, I'm playing the long game. She's playing to help little sister not have a bad day and, I'm, and Mom have a relationship with her that she wanted. There was a, a, a lady, a mother of many little children that bought a bunch of groceries she could barely afford. One was a jar of pickles. One, the jar of pickles fell off the, the buggy in the parking lot and smashed into smithereens. She walked back in the store and told the manager, I broke the pickles that I just bought. And he said, go get you another one off the shelf. We'll go get it for you. Don't worry about it. He's playing the long game. He's giving to her and winning a customer, right? A husband and wife are talking about their finances. And she says, let's, let's go ahead and buy that set of furniture and we'll just finance it. And he said, no, I've dedicated that set of money for our retirement. We know, you know we're on limited income we're fine with the couch and the chair and the table that we have he's playing the long game but here's what jesus says my mother the manager and the husband are still playing the short game what yeah what jesus says in this parable is humanly speaking people of this world know how to play a long game they know how to make sure that they use worldly wealth to engender friendship and commitment between people. They get the feeling from that natural knowledge of God that we love because we are first loved. And so they know how it, it wins people over if you're generous to them. But he said, what I've noticed, this is Jesus talking about you, by the way. Jesus says, what I've noticed about you is that as a believer, you don't know how to play the long game as well as the world does. You ready for the parable? This is what's so fascinating. This is the most unique parable Jesus ever taught. And it's unique because the, the, the hero of the parable is a bad dude. He's a cheater. And he wasn't cheating to win his daughter over and make her have a good day. And Jesus does that for a very important reason. So I'll read it to you now, the parable. There's a picture on the screen that shows the manager. And I think, I think, you'll, I think this will be sticky because Jesus makes it sticky and it'll, you'll take it home with you. Jesus told his followers, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig it. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So really before the accounting day with the master, he calls in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450, ha make it 50%. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended. Now he gets, he gets found out that he cheated this master. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, 
Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. This is language from another world. This is not what you'll see in the middle of an NFL football game advertisement about your retirement account and how you need to sign up with one of the investment companies to help get them to help you. Now this is another world. Did he really just say that? Did he use a guy that cheated others to say, do like that guy, but do it in a different realm? Use worldly wealth, exploit your house, your car, your money, your whatever it is that you possess. Use it to make friends for yourself for eternity. I'm asking you, God's people, did Jesus just say that? Yes or no? One, two, three. Yeah, that blows my mind. And that he would use a guy that cheated somebody. Why would he do that to make it sticky? You know, once you've read this, and many of you have read this before, and learned, you never forget it, right? It's the hardest parable to preach about because our sense of morality, and we're going to learn morality at church to say that you need to do what a guy did when he ripped off his master. But what this demonstrates with Jesus' parables that his points are always laser microscopic focus on usually on one main thing. And a parable like this, he will not let you try to decide what it is. The parable, uh, some of the other parables, he'll just let it hang there because he's got his reasons. Usually it's because the answer is obvious what it means. But this one, he's not going to leave it to us. He says, people of the world are more shrewd. If you look that word up in the original, it means thoughtfully wise. They're thinking it through. They're more shrewd in the way they handle each other than the way the people of the light do. I'm telling you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. I mentioned, I mentioned that the three people I started with today were not really playing the longest game. And one of them was about collecting our worldly wealth for retirement. I'm not, not about to preach to you, you shouldn't save for retirement. It's not what this is about. But if you think that's the sum total evidence that you have been wise with your life of possessions, you're thinking like a non-Christian. Did you hear me? If you think that the savings you have for the retirement years is, or any time you save it in any sector of your life, is being the wisest you can be with your possessions, you're wrong. The wisest you can be with your possessions is making friends for eternity. Wow, that is from another world. What's it look like? Well, there's only one person that did it 100%, right? Our Savior himself. That's what it looks like. When he got to the earth, he owned everything, right? But he gave it all up. He had given it up in heaven to come and live as a pauper. But how could he be a pauper? I'm challenging your, your logic. You know how at Christmas, and I'll preach it again this year, how Jesus was born in a humble circumstances for us. But how could he be a pauper if he really owned everything? He may be, he may be lived as a pauper, but he was the owner of everything of all the people's possessions around him. He is the owner of all things. And yet he lived as one who gave it all away for others, including the blessings of healing and raising the dead and feeding people miraculously many times. But if it would not have been miraculously, it still would have been holy and good and wonderful. So there's your example. Remember when they lowered that guy down through the roof of that house? And that because the crowd was so full around the house, they wanted their 
friend to be healed by Jesus. And before he healed him, do you remember what he said? That I'm, I'm moving to a new point that Jesus is making in his parable, but I'm going to glue them together. They lower this guy down. And before Jesus tells him to get up and walk, this is what Jesus says. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees said, there's no way he has the power to forgive sins. Who does he think he is? And Jesus said, well, what do you think? It's harder to say your sins are forgiven or take up your mat and walk to somebody who's been an invalid their whole life? He goes, which one do you think is harder? In their head, they're thinking, well, probably harder to say get up and walk. So he says, just to show you, I have the power to forgive sins. Get up and walk. And the guy got up after being all his life. On, on a mat and he walked out of there. And what, what Jesus was doing was pulling together the blessing of salvation and forgiveness for all human beings and the generosity in the pedestrian everyday life. He's bringing them together and saying generosity that's in the name of the Christ who saves, saves souls. What it does, when you're generous in the name of Christ to other people and they catch on that that's all part of why you're generous, you're sharing your life with them, but it's because you're a Christian, what it does is put skin on Jesus. You know, he ascended into heaven and we're the only Jesus some people will ever see. And so it puts skin on Jesus. Have you heard about paying it forward at Starbucks or other places? where you're in line and people will pay for the person behind them. One time it went all day long, and probably more than once, but it made the news that time. That's a wonderful thing. It made me go out and do that, pay for the person behind me. But if we were to ha listen to Jesus, we might want to add a little twist and say, write on a little slip of paper and say, hey, when you've given their coffee, give them this and say, your coffee was free, just like the forgiveness you get from the Lord. Maybe something that would connect it to the Jesus to make friends for eternity. There's an example. We have a, a pastor that goes every other day to a Verbo vacation rental where one of his members owns the Verbo and one of their other members lives there rather cheaply and the pastor goes and he bays his brother in the faith every other day. I just found out about this in the name of Jesus. Same pastor mows the yard of a 92 year old woman in a town 15 miles away as he met her for the first time and she said, why are you here? Your daughter goes to our church. She said, you have in need of a pastor and he said, what else do you need? And he said, well, I need my grass mowed. He's been mowing her grass for three years. He put skin on Jesus. Worldly wealth shared with someone in the name of Christ. And of course, she listens to his devotions. She came to his Bible studies and she joined his church. And she's a friend for eternity. This altar here, this altar here is Minnesota granite. About 20, we moved into this building in 2002. So about... 25 years ago, I was at a soccer game at UHO off of St. John's. You know where that is, right? And uh, one of our members had a little boy playing with, because my son was playing, and her dad was there. And her dad was having a lot of lung problems. And, and I, all I said to him, she said, hi, this is my pastor, and this is my dad. But she had told me that he'd had lung problems. I said, I'm praying for you. And I, and I said, I, I, I'm praying that the Lord will heal you and that you'll have peace in his name. You know, that's what we all say, right? Put skin on, if, we're, if we are praying for somebody, right? Later, he said that he would pray for me. He doesn't even know me. Which opened the door to take Bible study to his home 50 miles away. Where we now have a church. And he said, in thanksgiving for the gospel that you brought into our life through your generosity, I want to buy the altar stone or the altar at your church. And I said, how are we going to get it in there? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> well, there's another guy who used to sit outside. We had Bible study in the fellowship hall, and he'd sit outside while his wife and kids were in Sunday school and Bible class because he didn't want to come in. And he'd sit out there on a picnic table, so right after Bible class, I'd run out there and talk with him 
right? And he finally, through visiting him at the hospital a lot, came to Bible studies, joined our church. The kindness and generosity of our church won him over. And he knew a guy that had machines that would carry heavy things in the building and upstairs. So the two gener generous friends came together and they engineered bringing that big slab of 4,000 pound for this. And for 20 plus years, we've been serving the Lord's Supper off of it, praying to God from it. We have, we have friends from eternity because we put skin on Jesus. You see my point? Now what I'm trying to do is not brag. I'm trying to get you excited about what time you have left on earth. I'm trying to get you excited. Think, I, I hope you're thinking about people. Part of it is you're, it's affirming that you've been doing the right thing. And then part of it is like saying, oh, that's the right thing I want to start doing. Because the Spirit is using both, right? To, to teach us from this. And don't, this is where the knowing Jesus and showing Jesus gets connected in a parable like this. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's not talking to the Pharisees. He's not talking to the world. The parables to the disciples. He says, use wealth to win for yourselves friends from eternity. Because you know what? When you die, you got to cash in all my wealth because I'm going to give it to somebody else. It might be your kids. It might be somebody else. But I'm going to give it away. You only have it for a time while you're here. And it's really not yours. I own it all. There are no rich people and poor people. There are only managers. And you know that because you're my children. So you're my disciples. So I'm telling you, we're in the business of making friends with the wealth that we have. We are not in the business of being all about you and what you collect for yourself. He switches our thinking, right? And then we really begin to live the abundant life with that kind of generosity. Except there's this monkey on our back called the selfish, sinful nature. And he is so good at wearing costumes that you won't even recognize. And I know this is going to resonate with most of you that travel. I, for my larger job, I need to travel and fly some and I don't, I, I, I'm kind of a outdoorsy person and I've also got a lot of tension deficit and I don't like sitting there for three hours in one seat touching shoulders with somebody I don't know and they'd smell kind of funny. And so I certainly, because of my age, don't want to sit in the middle seat because I got to go to the bathroom more than the average person. So I always pay extra on certain airlines to get on the aisle, and I like the airlines, and I go for Southwest sometimes, but I like the airlines where you can pick your seat while you're set your flight, and I want to be on an aisle. I will let another human being sit between me and my wife just to be on the aisle. <laughs> she can sit by the window if she wants. I want it on the aisle. So you get how that's important to me, right? So I had paid extra on a Southwest flight to get early bird on so then you know you can run and, and get on the aisle full flight so i get on the aisle do you know who i am what i do for a living i'm a pastor of christ's mercy and generosity right i paid for this though it's 25 bucks a flight i'm sitting on the aisle and this this a flight attendant comes up where the plane's almost full and some woman who's in the c group who didn't plan ahead has her little baby, like about Bennett's age, right? And the flight attendant, all these people are looking at me because the flight attendant walks up and says, sir, there's a middle seat open to you and there's a middle seat in front of you. Do you mind moving forward one row and get in the middle seat so this woman can sit with her kids? Now, how am I gonna look if I say, no, I paid $25 for this seat. And I'm a pastor, by the way. It's like, I am stuck. Yes, I wasn't all happy. I, I wanted to tell him, you pay ahead of time so you don't have to get stuck in this situation. So I go up and sit in the middle seat and I'm trying to process my lack of maturity, my selfishness, my lack of generosity. I didn't give her that seat, it was taken from me. So I, I wasn't being generous. I was embarrassed into giving that seat up and I knew there's no credit before God for this. I'm just like, man, how do I deal with this? And then, just like the Spirit talks to you through the Word, I could sense the, the gospel kind of coming through you. God saying through the Word, you, you just experienced that I gave up my seat 
for you that I had paid for so you could sit where you wanted to, where you would want to, right? I paid with a perfect life and an innocent death for your seat, and you got to sit in it. And I said, okay, Jesus, right? Uh, that's where the knowing Christ teaches you to show Christ. And the, I trust God's Holy Spirit to take that final story and teach you to use worldly wealth to play the long game. Amen.